The American Civil War pitted northern states against southern ones for a total of four years. By all accounts, the conflict was known for some of the fiercest military campaigns in modern history. It was a war involving all people, with the population on both sides being immersed in the struggle. To this day, the cause of the war itself stirs debate. Two important factors remain, however. One, slavery ended as the result of the Civil War, and two, the United States entered the war as a young nation and emerged as a world power. The war also took its toll on West Tennessee. Well, it had a great impact on West Tennessee for a number of reasons. Uh, I suppose the first one is you had uh, quite a large number of people who fought in the war from West Tennessee and who fought on both sides. And so it, when you think about the Civil War being brother against brother, West Tennessee is a good place to, to find that. Many well-known names of the Civil War were, at one point or another, in Jackson and West Tennessee, including Ulysses Grant and Nathan Bedford Forrest. Some of the weapons used in the Civil War include this boat howitzer cannon used by the Union Navy and this sword made in Memphis. It's a foot officer sword and it was used by Confederate officers. Bill Rasp owns a museum here in Jackson. He told us why interest in the Civil War remains at an all-time high. Well, I think that I think we all know that that uh, the Civil War is all Americans and Americans fighting against each other and that that families were involved brothers against brothers cousins against cousins and this is passed down through family history and people just love to read about the civil war one of the fiercest clashes to take place in the war between the states occurred right here in west tennessee to federal troops it was known as pittsburgh landing to confederates it was simply shiloh general ulysses grant's 42,000 man union army fresh from a victory at Fort Donaldson, was marching towards Corinth, Mississippi to threaten the Confederate stronghold when they were surprised by General Albert Sidney Johnston and his 40,000-man Confederate force. The South, at one point, had Union forces at a distinct advantage. On Sunday, April 6, 1862, Confederate troops had Union soldiers backed all the way up to the Tennessee River with nowhere to go. General Johnston was killed during the brutal fighting that Sunday afternoon and was replaced by General G.T. Beauregard. One unique aspect of Shiloh was the incredible amount of fighting between the North and South, particularly at the Hornet's Nest. Well, the Hornet's Nest got its name by the number of bullets and, and projectiles that were, that were actually being fired at the, at the Union soldiers and uh, uh, they, they made a humming or a buzzing sound and, and uh, the Union soldiers gave this, this area, this sunken road area, the name of the hornet's nest. What eventually saved Union troops from what historians say would have been a sure defeat was the emergence of Union reinforcements led by General Don Carlos Buell during the night. Those additional troops allowed the Union to take the final victory, not without cost, however, to both sides. The bloodletting at the Battle of Shiloh was enormous. Union casualties numbered more than 13,000, while more than 10,000 Confederate casualties were sustained. No single place, however, symbolized the death and carnage more so than at Bloody Pond. Well, I think Bloody Pond is, is, is shows the, 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 the tragedy of, of the war and of the Battle of Shiloh. Uh, here, Union and Confederate soldiers uh, uh, crawled together, actually, uh, helping each other, trying to, to get some water to bathe their wounds, to, to drink out of this pond. Uh, it was literally filled with, with uh, after the battle, with dead men around the pond. And uh, it has a great historical significance and, and, and a human interest, I would say, uh, here at Shiloh. September 1862 was a busy time for the Confederate Army. Following a loss at Shiloh, plus the Union Army taking Corinth the following month, the fall of New Orleans proved to be a major blow to the Confederates in the West. In spite of those setbacks, the war raged on. That September, the Army of Tennessee, once commanded by Johnston and Beauregard, was now about to move north from Chattanooga into Kentucky, 
While here in Madison County, a small unexpected skirmish took place on a road known as Britain Lane. The Union forces were on the western part of Madison County and were fir at first told to go back into Jackson. And they got about halfway almost to Denmark beyond and then they were told to go back. And so um, the Confederate forces went up towards Meade and then turned west down on Britain Lane that we know today and were confronted with the Union forces going east and they met and had this Battle of Britain Lane on in September of 1862. It was a hard fought battle with Confederate forces led by Armstrong making five charges from east to west. The Union forces were in a tough defensive position however to ward them off. Armstrong had piecemealed his troops, sent some this way, some around this area, some around in this area, and of course this lane at the time was a field road. It was 14 foot wide, ditches on each side, two foot deep, and the soldiers four abreast came up this way. Forty horses, the best that we can tell, were mingled, wounded, shot, the men laying on top of men, men dying in this area. History says the smoke was so bad that the only thing you could hear was the screams of dying and the wounded. But uh, he came in this area some way, headed up this way, and he met a terrible force in the 3rd Illinois. They had him up uh, in the area where they could fire down on his troops. One significant factor about the Battle of Britain Lane, it's being called in modern times the battle that people forgot. 3,000 troops fought at Britain Lane, 196 in all were killed, with one note of historical importance in the form of young William Jett. The young gentleman that came through here, he was 13 years, 9 months old. His uh, father had been killed at Shiloh. His name was William Jett. He came in this area and joined Forrest, where it was for adventure, where it was Forrest, his reputation had done reached him in Alabama, or I mean in Georgia. But he came here and he joined Forrest, and this was his first battle, and at 13 years, 9 months old, he was killed here. He is the youngest boy that was killed in the state of Tennessee during the Civil War. A constant thorn in the side of federal forces during the Civil War was Brigadier General Nathan Bedford Forrest. His cavalry brigade had a reputation for being lightning fast, and he would later go down in history for, among other things, being one of the pioneers of modern warfare. Forrest was on his way back to Middle Tennessee on New Year's Eve, 1862, when he was surprised by two separate Union brigades who converged upon him in the Henderson County area known as Parker's Crossroads. Much of that area remains the way it was in 1862, including this cabin. This is the area that Forrest, General Forrest, camped for two nights prior to the Battle of Parker's Crossroads. It was while camped here that he gathered information on the Union troops' movements. He had plenty of good water here for his men. He was on a high ridge, which was important to a campsite during the winter. And so he was able to stay here in an isolated area till he could determine what his uh, opposition was and where they were located. And from here, he moved to Parker's Crossroads and fought the battle on the morning of the 31st of December, 62. Union sentiment during the war between the states was strong in many areas of the South, particularly in Henderson County. One such Union sympathizer was Reverend John Parker. Reverend John Parker lived at Parker's Crossroads, actually at the crossing, and during the battle, uh, the Union commander was placing artillery in his yard around his house, and he went to the commander and asked him to move the artillery because he would attract fire from General Forrest's cannons, and the, the commander didn't do it, uh, even though Parker told him that he'd been a Republican, had voted for Abraham Lincoln, was a supporter of the Union, and they ought to uh, save his home. And so that made him so mad that they wouldn't move their artillery out of his yard that one of his last requests was to his family on his deathbed that when they buried him here in the Jones Cemetery, that they bury him facing the north, that on Judgment Day and Gabriel sounds a call that we all rise up, the dead rise up to meet the Lord, that uh, he'd come up kicking the Yankees back north. Forrest's uncanny ability to outflank two Union brigades made him the subject to many of those interested in military science, including the Desert Fox, German General Erwin Rommel. The artillery, the way he used his artillery, had not been done before. And the way he would maneuver his troops uh, during battle and uh, while helping to look for other troops 
was significant, and uh, so it attracted the the students of uh, military history, such as Rommel, and he came and followed some of the routes and raids that Forrest had made in West Tennessee. While the Civil War raged from 1861 through 1865, life was hard for many people here in West Tennessee who suffered during the war. For blacks, it was no exception. West Tennessee was predominantly an agricultural area with many slaves throughout the region. A number of blacks fought during the Civil War, mostly on the Union side, but some did indeed wear the Confederate gray. Over 200,000 soldiers fought for the Union. Of course, uh, officially, didn't too many fight for, officially they didn't fight for the Confederate Army. But in this particular area in West Tennessee, blacks played a major role as laborers, scouts, guides. They also fought along the railway lines. And of course, we all familiar with Fort Pillar. Uh, there, at that particular battle, there was some, nearly 50% of the soldiers were black. Over the past five days, we've given you an idea of what the monumental scope was of human suffering and triumphs and tragedies that took place right here in West Tennessee during the war between the states. To people like Dorothy Porter, who owns this cabin at Parker's Crossroads, it's a matter of family history. It's just the greatest joy that Bob and I have had in our lives that we were able to come back and to find the little spot that we could buy uh, and to restore the cabin. And we have eight grandchildren and that's what I'm trying to teach them is their heritage and the the history of our country and how that uh, all of us have uh, been a part in making the country.